talking to Johnny Kelly from Typo Negative and various other awesome bands and projects. I teched for the band uh, for maybe like one or two local shows. I remember once they played in Staten Island. Uh, I worked for them there. And then there was one trip. Uh, they had a show in California, in Los Angeles. And uh, they asked me to go, you know, whatever, to help drive and stuff like that. And we, we made a whole excursion out of it. I was gone. We were gone for like two weeks, you know, to do one show. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And then there was one, another trip where they, uh, they had one show in Atlanta. And I helped, you know, with that. But, you know, I think I was much better at being in the band than, you know, than working for it. <laughs> now, were you, um, so you knew Saul? I've known, I, like when, yeah, I mean, you know, we all come from the same neighborhood. Yeah. And I, Sal and I have been friends since we were teenagers, you know, <laughs> as well as like, you know, Kenny and, you know, I knew Josh. I didn't know Peter as well. But like you know, I had met him a few times, and uh, Carnivore used to rehearse at the studio I used to work at. Oh, I used to work wow. at a rehearsal studio, and, and that you know, so I knew him from there. And then you know, eventually you know, with Typo, you know, with Kenny, you know, I was in a band with Kenny for years before he joined Typo, and uh, you know, so I knew, you know, we knew everybody, every, and everyone knew me, you know, when I came in. So it's like they knew what kind of psychological you know baggage I had, so they kind of made it easy to transition, you know, when Sal, when Sal left. So it wasn't a strange thing or to jump, jump in and take over or was it? Uh, it was definitely different, you yeah. know, uh, you know, as opposed to like, you know, whatever, just being around and like, you know, hanging out and, you know, being a fan of the band as, and then like, you know, now you're in it and you, you know, you're playing with them and stuff, you know, it was fun. You Is know, that I mean, you, it was exciting, yeah. you know, for sure. Yeah. Is that when you first met Peter? When you no, were I knew I knew Peter. I knew Peter for years before I joined Typo Negative. Did you like play music together? Like, no, we younger? never did. No, we never did. I mean, Peter's like, you know, he was like, he, he was six years older than me. So like, you know, like when, when I'm, you know, when I'm 15 starting to play drums, you know, he's already like, you know, advanced and, you know, Carnivore was already around, like, you know, doing yeah. shows and stuff. I remember seeing the flyers, like, you know, on the, the telephone poles. Carnival. Yeah. <laughs> I and I, so I wasn't, young, I'm a baby. I wasn't old enough to go to clubs, so I couldn't see them, you know. And that that that's where, like, you know, like that age difference is seems a lot greater when you're younger, as opposed to like, you know, when everybody's in their twenties. When you and Peter first started to do music together, was it? Did you get together as friends first, or was it more of just like, let me let me try out this drummer, or let's let's try to jam on something, or did well, you get to know I each mean, other? I mean, well, we, we knew each other, you know, from like, you know, the studios and stuff and, you know, me playing in local bands and carnival rehearsing in the same studios and, you know, me working at the studio. So every everybody knew each other rather well. What actually inspired you to go on tour with Carnivore? There's a lot of old school um, hardcore bands <laughs> that are getting back together and stuff. It's you know, kind of inspiring. I figured, well, you know, why not? Let's it was funny. Carnivore, you know. How did you guys get together with Carnivore? What? <laughs> All right, she joked. Well, we've known, I've known Peter for a long time, about 20 years, um, and we've always had an idea about getting together and doing something, and it's just a, a matter of uh, finding the right situation. Our relationship definitely took a different turn when we started playing in a band together and then, you know, traveling on a bus, you know, for years, and, you know, yeah. you, you get to know each other a lot more than you would but just, like, you know, seeing somebody in passing in the neighborhood. Of course, of course. But, um... You know, yeah, I remember like, you know, like when he worked for the parks department, I worked for the post office, we would sit there and see each other in the lobby of the, of the studio. I'd be like, hey, you know, what's up? How's the job? Oh, what kind of benefits do you get? You know, and like, that's, that's kind of stuff we c would compare. Is that true, uh, the point of contention that Peter didn't want to tour because of his job? Or Initially, yeah, that, that's when I first joined the band. Uh, you know, Peter used to come, I used to work at a, at a speed shop on Coney Island Avenue, and Peter used to come in with his car all the time, and I would do work on his car for him, and, uh, you know, when I, uh, right before I joined the band, you know, he came and he talked to me, you know, and he was like, you know, it's, it's not that kind of band, like, you know, don't quit your day job, and I was like, well, you know, I kind of know the drill, you know, I've been around you guys long enough, I'm not really expecting it. Really, I thought it would be something where it was going to be... You know, maybe do some weekend warrior stuff, like, you know, go play in Connecticut or like, you know, somewhere out of town on the weekends, come back and go to work. And, uh, you know, if, we, if, if the band was going to stay together long enough, you know, maybe I can get on a record. You know, really, that was like that was that was the goal initially. 
because we really didn't think that the band would be together that long. Every time we did a tour, like even the first one, when we were able to, you know, Peter was willing to go on the road, but he had he had all this vacation time accumulated. He could go anyway, and he was so he was collecting a check anyway. You know, he just wasn't really into the touring environment. It wasn't something that interested him. Yeah. And um, so, like, really, the expectations weren't that great. You know, for typo negative period. The drums were they drum machines? Uh, yeah, the last record we did with live drums. Everything else, the the uh, what, the October Rust, the World Coming Down, Life Is Killing Me. We did that all with samplers and stuff in Josh's house. So would you program the the beats? And yeah, stuff yeah. When you yeah. Learn it. That's up. So I mean, well, the way it worked out was like you know we would work the stuff out in a, in a rehearsal studio. You know, we'd all play together and stuff. And then when it came time to like start doing demos and stuff, we did we did all that stuff in Josh's you know spare bedroom. Now, was it true that uh, Origin of the Feces was recorded? In Josh's basement? No, that wasn't in his basement. Okay. That, was, that it was recorded in, I think it was recorded in systems too. But it was, uh, you know, it was just, you know, just running the tape, and uh, it was supposed to be a recreation of the first European tour that the band did because everything, all the jokes and like you know, all the stuff that's the that people get, yeah. that that all really happened, and they were trying to recreate that vibe on a on a record, you know. Well, was it refreshing to do live drums in the studio to record for the Dead Again? Uh, was it a different approach or was it the same? It was a different approach. The record, like, you know, the songs themselves, you know, kind of lent itself to, to live drums. It had a more like a more of like a jamming element, which is really like, you know, the way the record was developed was like really just months of jamming. And then we were like, finally, we were like, all right, we got to stop. You know, it's not, it's getting the, the songs are getting worse. You know, we, we got to stop and you know just go in and record it and so there was a lot more jamming going on and we, you know we felt that it was so you know it was so is that the it would work process? you know with live drums yeah. now every record was you know every record was different you know like we were in a different in a different headspace as people and like you know where we were in our careers and you know things that were going on around us at you know different times so it's like you, you can't just like you know like in a you're talking like almost almost 20 years of, of making records you can't you can't really expect to have the same, uh, like the, the, the same, the same procedures as yeah. far as like you know, like to create music. You know, like right. the, even that was different. Well, you know, was it strange when like in the '90s when it all blew up to see like you know bands like Typo and Biohazard all of a sudden on MTV and like getting like a lot of recognition? Is that a strange thing? And then I mean, I remember like you know, I remember being in a bar seeing Typo on Beavis and Butthead for the first time, and I was just like you know, <laughs> but it was funny like you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow, it'd be funny if like you know, Beavis and Butthead made fun of Typo. There's a lot to make fun of. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, there I see it on the television. I'm looking up and I'm like, no way. And then I remember like trying to do. You know, this was like before cell phones and stuff, and I remember getting to a phone. I just saw the video on, on Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> and we were like, you know, thankfully they liked it. And so we were like, you know, let's just hold on and, you know, see what happens. Yeah. You know, hold on and hope for the best. But like a lot of that stuff really, it, it, you know, it was nice to see like, you know, like the band accomplishing something, but everybody pretty much took it in stride. And it was just, you know, just another day at the office, so to speak, you know, like we just, <laughs> All right, you know that that was cool. You know, you know what's happening now. Like, you know, what's tomorrow hold? You know. You said so. like uh, writing each album was different. Was World Coming Down like uh, supposed to be a departure from kind of the pop uh, stylings of October Rust and Bloody Kisses? Nothing was there? ever. There was never a conscious effort to say, you know what, we did this on this record. Let you know what we're going to go in this direction now. It was never like that. There wasn't any kind of uh, preconceived notions. There was no agenda. It was just get in a room. This is what happened. You know, lyrically, some stuff took different changes and stuff because Peter, you know, had a lot of ups and downs in his life. And that that record, the World Coming Down, was probably like, you know, the most honest record that he wrote lyrically, you know, between yeah. maybe that and like the first record, you know. Yeah. Do you have like yeah. any crazy stories or any any memories from every on day tour? Was, every day was a crazy <laughs> story, you know, you know, something, you know, nuts happened. Let's, it's let's, like, you know, like a lot of stuff happened. But a lot of stuff really didn't happen. It's like you really don't pay attention to it because it's like, you know, that's just the circus that you live in. So it's like, 
Yeah, so every know. day was a circus. You know, so, with yeah, some, <laughs> right, somebody, you know, like a like a like a woman comes over and she's squirting breast milk on you one day, you know, and then the next day, you know, somebody's somebody's pulling a sort of shotgun on you and you know, like it yeah. it's just another day, you know, you really don't pay attention to it, but like, you know, like for the regular person, you know, they make their head spin. Yeah. Wow. You know, like, uh, all right, here's one, right? We're in Memphis. We're playing the New Daisy Theater in Memphis on the World Coming Down Tour. The bass player from one of the support bands was hanging out with some girl afterwards. We were in another bar, hanging out with some girl. The girl winds up on the crew bus, hanging out with somebody from our crew. So this guy, this bass player, he's like, you know, he's all drunk and everything, and he's looking for his girl, who he thinks is now his girlfriend. <laughs> Goes on the crew bus, nobody from the crew recognizes it that it's the bass player from the other band. And the guy tries to run into the back of the bus to get his girl. He gets kicked in the face by the crew guys and thrown off the bus. So this whole fight happens, right in the middle of the parking lot. There's this whole fight. So everybody's out and like, you know, we wind up breaking up the fight and stuff and we're all like, you know, all right, get your bass player back to his, back to his bus, you know, this and that. So while all this is going on, there were these two big, huge black guys that looked like they were fresh out of prison. They decide to stroll up on the crew bus because the door was open. Like, there's a whole fight going on over here. These guys <laughs> see the fight, and they go, oh, look, an open door to a bus. Let's go on it and see what's going what? on. No way. The crew comes back. These guys are now cornered in the bus. There were, there were crew guys on the bus that weren't involved in the fight. <laughs> and then there's the crew guys that come back. Now they're sandwiching these two guys, and it's like, what are you doing on a bus? <laughs> All of a sudden, this huge fight breaks out, and I'm sitting in the I'm sitting in the band bus, and I'm looking out the window. I'm like, "There's another fight going on." <laughs> wow. So, so everybody comes back off the bus, right? All these people are fighting these two guys. There's like ten guys, and they're holding their own, and they're doing really well. <laughs> My tour manager comes out. He's like, hey, what's going on? Not knowing that it's like, you know, two street guys. Tour manager comes out, hey, I'm the tour manager. What's going on? And the guy just takes them and throws them into the bus, into the, into like the, the metal doors. No. He puts his collarbone into the doors of the bus. That's it. He's out on the floor. Finally, the cops show up. The cops break up everything. Wow. Mike's, our tour manager is all busted up. Makes it all, the, it was like a cul-de-sac kind of thing in the parking lot. Makes everybody sit down. It's, you have to sit down and shut up. Wow. And so the cops are trying to suss out what happened or whatever. <laughs> sit down and shut up. One of the guys says something. The cop didn't even bat an eyelash. Pulls out his mace, mace the guy, and said, I thought I told you to shut up. This is Tennessee, right? Yeah, this Remind is Memphis. Remind me to never yeah, go this there. Is, this is right on, this is Beale, this is on Beale Street. So everybody, <laughs> everybody's sitting down, not saying a word. They just take the guys and say, you know, tell them, get out of here. You guys get in your bus and go where you got to go. So we had to take our tour manager to the hospital because he's got a busted shoulder. We were in the room where Elvis Presley was declared dead. That was one night, you know, so that's it. That's, you know, that, that's one night. So, like, you know, yeah, it's kind of crazy and stuff. But for us, it was just like, you know, another night on tour. A day in the life yeah. of John Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, where were you when you found out Pete had passed away? Uh, I was home. I was home. I uh, I was actually on my way to Brooklyn to go rehearse with Seven Void. And uh, I had seen uh, a number come up on my cell phone that I didn't recognize. So I just let it go to voicemail. And so then when I got in my car to you know go, I was like, oh, let me check my voicemail, whatever. And it was Peter's sister. And then Peter's sister, you know, I called her back and she told me that Peter was gone. And I was like, what do you mean by gone? You know, like, like, like he ran off somewhere or like, you know, disappeared or, you know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and it, she was like, no, he's gone. Like, you know, not, not living anymore. So, so that's how I found out, you know, and then I, you know, I, I ran upstairs. Like, you know, I was like, I was in, I was in shock. I was in shock and I, you know, I'm like. I go back into my house and I, t I tell my girlfriend, I'm like, Peter's dead, I gotta go to Brooklyn. And she's like, what, 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 what? what? You know, cause I was like, I was going to see Kenny. So I was like, let me, you know, I wanted to tell him in person. And then on the way, on the way to Brooklyn, I called Josh and told him and you know, 
And I told Slitzy, I was picking up Slitzy, you know, to come hang out. And then that's, you know, that was that night, you know, and it was, you know, yeah. And you were kind of the spokesperson too, for like on the website posting things and. Well, I've, I'm like, you know, it's, it, you know, it was just something that like, you know, Josh and I had more interaction on the internet with, with fans. Peter never went online, so he, <laughs> he had no use for it, you know, and he was like, anytime that he did go on there, he just got aggravated, you know, seeing, you know, the things that people were writing. And, so he never, I mean, I mean, for a long time, a part of it was frustrating, too, because, like, you know, you'd send emails, you know, regarding other aspects of, like, you know, like, you know, a tour's coming up or we got press. So, you know, whatever it is, uh, Peter, you got to check your email. <laughs> you know. Did you check your email? No, I haven't been online. I, I don't I don't go on there. Like, just check your email. So, like, you know, that was the other end of it. You know, Kenny, you know, Kenny's not a big Internet guy either. You know, he doesn't do Facebook or any of that stuff. So Josh and I were more involved you know uh, internet wise like you know was, you know interacting you know with fans and stuff and, you know putting up posts and, yeah. you know things like that and josh wasn't on the last tour was it he was in school yeah was, and he's now a paramedic yeah he's an emt yeah so yeah gets, so so when did the whole situation with peter become like real to you like were you working on new music with him at no the time we or were anything? no we were supposed to start like he died april 14 uh he was living out in Pennsylvania, like out in Scranton. And uh, the night before he died, Kenny and I had found a rehearsal studio that, you know, a studio where we were gonna start working on the record. And um, that was in Staten Island. Peter was moving to Staten Island, you know, May 1st. So we, I was living in Staten Island, Kenny was living in Staten Island. Peter was gonna move to Staten Island. We had found a studio in Staten Island and everything was supposed to happen like you know we were going to get the room may 1st peter was you know moving back to you know back to new york may 1st and that's basically when things were going to get started and peter had, you know like later on in, in our careers like you know peter wouldn't like you know sit home and, and work on music he just didn't do it. it it was always you know he needed to have us in the room with him you know to work so, like, you know, I would talk to him, like, you know, do you have anything prepared? He's like, well, you know, I have a couple of ideas. He's like, you know, but nothing, yeah. you know, nothing, you know, concrete or whatever. Well, I read that on, like, the past, um, like, eight months of the Dead Again tour. It was, like, really refreshing. Like, did you feel that? Like, you guys were all back to how it was, like, energized? And no, the, and no, the, the Dead Again tour was, like, you know, there was, there was some pretty crazy moments. And, like, you know, at all times, the wheels felt like they were falling off the bus. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, for a lot of fun that it was, it was like, you know, it was very turbulent as well. And, uh, you know, but yeah, there was, <laughs> it was more like, fright. I tried to get a stun gun. <laughs> Can you elaborate a little on that one? Well, I didn't, you know, it was like, you know, I was worried about like, you know, getting attacked in my bunk while I was sleeping. So I was like, you know, I wanted to have a stun gun with me in case anybody, you know, came in and, eh. It was that. It was that crazy. Yeah. Like what you were at each yes. other's throats and stuff. It was. It was. It was crazy. It was uh, very unpredictable. You know, like a lot. You know, there was definitely. Uh, you know, it was definitely hostile. I mean, you know, at the same time, a lot of laughs. Like you know that we always had and stuff. But you know, Peter. Well, not even so much that. This was like you know when the record was done. You know, like the record like developing Dead Again took months, and it was months of going to Rockaway and working on like you know just rehearsing, and rehearsing. I, I, we were rehearsing some nights, like, you know, six nights a week, like, you know, for hours. And it would just, it would just keep going on. Next type of negative album <laughs> contractually has to be delivered by December 1st. So my, my priority is just to get this thing done. And then, uh, and then we'll see what happens after that. Great. So Carnivore's taking a little break? Or are you still gonna play live shows? Type negative has to come first, let's put it that way. And, okay. you know, I, I've had a conversation with Steve, Paul, and Joey, and they, they also have uh, other things. Uh, Paul and Steve have a um, mental health association. Joey is, is going to be doing something with LOA soon. So this is, uh, you know, when it's convenient to get back together for fun, then, uh, then we're going to do it. Once the record was recorded, you know, it was like, it was really, it was a big sigh of relief. You know, we were really, you know, finally, we were like, thank God that it's finally over. But it like, you know, making records with Typo, it like, it really did, it took a piece out of you. You know, you were, you know, like physically and emotionally exhausted. Do you have a favorite record or a good, like, an experience for a recording that was just 
excellent or that you just look back on and say that was great? Oh, well. <laughs> even <Maybe> or <laughs> a favorite song, even. <laughs> Do you have a have favorite, favorite typo song? I have favorite songs, of course, yeah. But like, you know, like to say that was a great experience. But I mean, you, yeah. you could ask anybody that and it'd just be like, you know, like what you think about, like, you know, the, getting a record done is like, you know, you're pulling your hair out and you're fighting and you, you know, it's like, I mean, you're all trying to like, you know, you have a common goal, but it really did. It was so taxing on you. It's like you, you were completely wiped out. It was like going 12 rounds with Tyson. That you've had such it an effect did. on people and, you know, well, I mean, that's, the music, that, well, that's, it's, that's, it's, it's really, you know, it's changed people's lives and it's that's, an amazing That's thing. the positive that comes out of it. You yeah. Know, that, that's, you know, right. that, that's, that's the, that's the good byproduct right. of it, you yeah, know, I aside mean, from like, you know, the yeah. bad byproduct of being like, you know, completely jaded and bitter and frustrated, you know, and it's like, you know, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it was, uh, a lot of it was fun and it was, it was a great experience and it was, it was, it was great to be able to have the opportunity to do it as many times as we did, you know, and, and, and had Peter been alive, you know, who knows when, you know, when the band would have, you know, finally said, all right, that's it, you know. If Pete was still here, I what mean, would you say to him? Would, would you have, like, uh, uh, something you'd want to him? tell him, I'd like, say, you something know, ridiculous that you'd want to tell him I if he was still had, around? I always had ridiculous things to tell him. I mean, I would talk to him all the time when he was in Pennsylvania, like, you know, when give he... Me, give, me one, give me one retarded thing that you'd want to say to Pete. <laughs> Well, no, actually, you know, like, like, you know, we would goof, but it was always like, you know, goofing at someone else's expense. <laughs> That's the best kind of goofing. How is it, um, you play with the Pale Horse. Yeah. How's it playing with uh, Sal? And, like, two type of drummers in the same band now, and one... You know. Well, you know, Sal and I, we've been friends a long time, and it was, uh, you know, when he was first started working on Pale Horse, and, he, you know, he, you know, he did, you know, he played me the record, you know, he was like, you know, this is what I'm up to, and I was, you know, I was really blown away by it, I was like, wow, it's like, it's like this is really good, I said, I had no idea you could sing, <laughs> I mean, I knew he could play drums, but I didn't think he could sing, and, uh, really, it kind of was like, you know, joking around, I was like, like you, you, you've never fronted a band before. And it's like, you know, I would tease him about that. And then I was like, you know, you know, we just got on to talking about like, you know, putting the band together and stuff. And it was like, you know, hey, it'd be pretty funny if I played for your band. You know, he said, you know, imagine what people would say, like, you know, the two drummers from Typo playing in a band together. And then like, you know, whatever, a couple of months went by and then it was time for him. He was starting to put a band together and him and Matt asked me if I wanted to, to do it. Yeah, sure, yeah. So how many projects are you currently involved in? And do you play any other instruments? Are you have you ever tried to play with anything? I mean other I than I, the I could play I could play a little bit of guitar and bass, but not anything that I would actually sit there and brag about or you know, yeah. I try I tried to learn to play it so that I could apply it to playing drums better. So I can understand so I can understand what's going on around me instead of just being, you know Absolutely just being the drummer. Yeah. 